Glad the election's over? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's good to just uh, get back to the business of governing and uh, all the great things we have going on. So uh, it was five necessary months, but it was five very long months. It's, it's very much a case-by-case -case thing. You know, we've had unanimous support um, for pension reform. We had unanimous support to bring in the health and wellness clinic, um, unanimous support to change the Public Safety Advisory Commission, which was so controversial during Mayor Weatherington's tenure. And so for a number of things, we've actually had unanimous support. I think what's been unsettling about this particular council and this particular first four years of the administration is we've had some really tough issues. Uh, really tough issues, and I think that human nature, at least for some money issues, money issues, which goes right to the heart of you know the most difficult legislative decisions they make, um, and I think you know you would hope typical human reaction is to hope you can keep the course you're familiar with, and everything will be okay, and with each passing day, it was just clear. Um, that we could not stay that course that everyone was familiar with, but we had to make some radical change, um, which nobody wanted to have to deal with because they felt like the pension reform would be the third rail, obviously, of Columbus politics. Um, they felt, you know, here we are reforming our health care, uh, we'll know today after the meeting, but um, possibly to a savings of $4.5 million a year, uh, which is something no one wanted to have to deal with. And so, as I said in some of the debates, if you give people an opportunity, um, to take a back door, uh, which my opponent said he wouldn't deal with these issues, wouldn't have these types of discussions, then that can look awfully interesting. Are you going to approach council the next four years the same way you have the last yes, four? Yes, definitely. So you're not going to change yeah, anything well, think, in the way you approach and deal with Columbus Council? Yeah, because I think the consistency, I think what they will see, it, it, for the few that had some issues, I think what they will see is these were not political power plays. These were steady, consistent um, observations about how we needed to change and substantive solutions about how to change them. Um, you know, I had one longtime political veteran of Columbus tell me that the issue was that many counselors, many elected officials felt they couldn't control me. And I, I really, I slept I don't on say that hard. I slept anybody. on that hard um, because really, I think what it is, is is it's not the way politics used to be. Uh, we're just in a new era of municipal government. It just doesn't work the same way. And so I, I feel like one of the things that may have been misconstrued is that um, some elected officials felt like I was trying to um, control them or trying to... Were you? No. I, either trying to control them or trying to make a power play uh, that somehow in your to my benefit and not to theirs and the fact of the matter I think which will now be seen because I will continue the same steady um, solutions based type um, uh, approach that I've had is that wow she really does get up the same way and she does the same thing every single day um, in a way it's like Groundhog Day I get up I get in here and I look for the places that we need to correct and I find potential solutions to those and I put them on the table even when uh, they're very controversial and people are sort of shocked about that. And so Pops and I have been in the trenches a lot together um, but that was that um, legislative camaraderie, elected camaraderie, whatever you want to call it was earned over projects and that's when you say what do you intend to do with the counselors that you know were on the other side of this particular election? You build relationships through specific interactions. Um, you don't have a dinner party and expect everything to be kumbaya after the dinner party's over. Um, but you you build those relationships through being in the trenches with people, helping them out when they need something, um, or vice versa. And then that um, productive you know, activity leads to a relationship and people seeing what you're really worth. Well, who wouldn't regret losing $35 million? I mean, certainly I think we regret that. I think the whole community regrets the loss of the opportunity. I will say, take exception to one thing you said in your question, it was not my, my revitalization effort. That was a revitalization effort begun in 2004 and actually was part of an effort that had been very consistently moved forward 
long before I ever took office. My my oh, but when it, it came but when yeah. it came to a head, you were at the forefront. Absolutely, because I didn't want us to lose that opportunity. Okay. I was so afraid um, that actually what happened would happen, uh, which was that for the sake of trying to um, adjust things more a particular way, we were going to lose the whole. Uh, because I, I didn't feel people appreciated the federal and state timelines uh, that were going to make us lose the whole opportunity. Um, and so that's where I came in, was to say, um, you know, we have to be very careful here. I think that made me, it, and I will, I will say this, Calvin and Robert Anderson were also standing side by side with me, as were many others um, who were very invested saying the same thing. But for some reason, I, I became the convenient lightning rod of the only person speaking out. And as you know, but Lynn it, Williams was there, and the city manager was there as well. But somehow, but you became the lightning rod yeah. after the it was reported your statements in a community room. Yes. Uh, that's when you became a lightning rod. Was after it was reported what you said to a group of BTW residents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you agree with that? I, I think that yes, absolutely. I think people were so shocked that that it would actually be said that what we were about to lose $35 million um, and that it was going to, you know, what was interesting about that was that nobody had gone to the BTW residence and told them what was going on. And we were sitting in, in actually the city manager's conference room with Calvin and I think Robert Anderson was on conference call and Lynn Williams and some other stakeholders realizing that this was going south, that we only had about three weeks um, and we were going to lose it. And I said, well, do the BTW residents want us to go forward? Because if they're not interested in this plan, then then we don't need to be wasting any of our time uh, working. And they said, well, nobody's really told them yet. And I said, well, I think we need to have a meeting with BTW residents and tell them this is about to get very controversial. Um, this is going to, to, you know, really be a fight here. And if they're not interested in this, if they would prefer to wait, we can do that. You campaigned four years ago on lifting the freeze. You've talked about it throughout the last four years of ways to lift the freeze gradually. Are you going to still pursue lifting the, the, ta the property tax freeze in Columbus? I've never suggested lifting the property tax freeze. And so unless you restate your question, I'm not going to answer that question. I think that the property tax freeze is a constitutional entitlement. I don't think you can lift it. And so um, what I have suggested, uh, which is contrary to your question, uh, because I've never suggested lifting the property tax freeze, is that You've if you suggested gradually phasing out the property tax freeze. I've suggested that if you have it, you keep it in perpetuity. But from a date but in the future... once there's a sale of that house, then that freeze is gone. So you right, gradually right. phase it out. So, I'm going to argue with you a little bit yeah, on this because no, I think, well, I think I, we're talk, I, saying the same thing. No, You're not if you say like lift the lawyer. freeze. I don't think you can lift the freeze. I don't think you can lift the freeze. And so what you have to say is you have to say everybody that has the freeze keeps the freeze in perpetuity, but all new transfers vest in a new system with a 10% property tax decrease. That's the plan. That's phasing out the freeze. That would mean that with time, as new transfers occur, fewer and fewer people would have the freeze because they would be vesting in a new tax system with a 10% property tax decrease. Are you going to pursue yes. that option? Yes. I've been pursuing it every day. I'm going to pursue the discussion. It's that important, and I cannot tell you the broad appeal that it has um, with seniors, because seniors are downsizing. The, here are the things that, that, that we cannot get over right now with the current system we have. Seniors are downsizing, and when they do, they're hit with a tremendous amount of tax impact, because they're going from a four-bedroom, three-and-a-half bath house at $300 a year taxes. They go to a two-bedroom, two-bath house, and now they've got $3,000 in taxes a year. Um, they, they are having real trouble with that. The other thing is we're one of the only jurisdictions in the country, maybe the only jurisdiction in the country, that taxes people on property value they can prove they do not own. So when their assessment goes down because of a recession or whatever, your property valuation is still frozen in an upward position. So we have thousands of people in Columbus, Georgia right now who can prove to us that the $250,000 house that they bought in 2006, whatever it may be, 2007, is now only worth $200,000, and we don't care. We continue to tax them at $250,000. So we actually tax people on value that they can prove they don't own, and we agree they don't own any longer. Does the freeze jeopardize?
Columbus's long-term financial stability? There is no doubt that the freeze has been an economic development hindrance on us. Um, there is no doubt that it makes um, running our city government very, very difficult and also pushes taxes around to other places that are less transparent. And I don't think people appreciate that. We have one of the, we have the highest occupancy tax rate in the state of Georgia, um, and that is an economic development deterrent. Uh, and so you're talking about jobs and things of that nature. We have we have pushed our taxes around, as has every other jurisdiction. No jurisdiction has the draconian um, cap that we have, uh, which is absolute. Uh, it has like no more than three percent a year. Uh, can you increase? But of those that do have those kinds of caps, uh, they definitely do not save taxes. They simply push them around in less transparent means. That through communication, um, you can right almost any wrong. Um, a lot of lessons, a lot of lessons. And that the person that your arch enemy today uh, may be your co-counsel and best advocate tomorrow. Give me an example government, in your four years of government, somebody that was an enemy that came over to the other side. Give me an example. A Pops Barnes. I mean, you know, Pops... He didn't support you? Okay. No, didn't didn't support me to begin with. Also, um, Pops, as you know, ran against Nathan, who's a dear friend of mine. And I remember when, actually, Nathan lost and Pops won, and I was still at Midtown. I, I had a meeting with Pops, and I remember telling him, um, you know, that Nathan and I didn't start out friends at all. Uh, I was one of his outspoken constituents and I'm sure a thorn in his side on many, many days. But over years we grew um, to be very respectful and then of course friendly toward one another and that I saw that for he and me as well. And I, I don't know how truthful he thought that that would ring in the future. I'll tell you when I was, um, it was in the Minneapolis case, I was alone. Um, and everybody in the, everybody that was going to be in the courtroom was at least 20 years older than me, 20 years more experience. And I went to the women's room where it was the only place I could be assured to be alone in that kind of environment, if you catch my drift. And um, I, uh, I looked in the mirror and I thought, you know, they're going to try to kill me in there. And I thought, the only thing I can do, I'm going to pretend like the judge and I are in an ele stuck in an elevator and I've got two minutes to tell them what's really going on. And I walked in there and I just I just went to the core of my soul and I just spoke and I said exactly what was going on and there was slack jaw all over the courtroom. Uh, they could not believe that I had just said what was going on. And, um, and the judge, I think, was even shocked. But the effect of that... Male or female judge? Um, actually, that was the magistrate, so that was a woman judge, and then the next day it was the male judge, uh, who was the federal judge, um, because of course they immediately kicked us up to the federal judge the minute they found out what was happening in that particular case. But I learned a very valuable lesson is that time is precious, and if you've got something to say, you need to say it, you need to say it now. Uh, and you need to tell people exactly what it is you're talking about, and not him and haw around um, the matter. Uh, because a lot of times people don't understand what you're trying to say um, and so you need to just get to the heart of the matter as quickly as possible. In Columbus, Georgia during this time is that harder for a woman to do than a man? I actually think um, that women, I mean to the extent you can generalize, I mean these are huge yeah. gender yeah, generalizations yeah. obviously, um, but I actually think women um, are, are perceived as being more um, genuine um, and, uh, and more heartfelt with what they're saying um, and uh, more fair, uh, again, to generalize. And so I think people receive that um, very well. Uh, I think, you know, sure, you're going to run into some uh, small group of folks who, who like the way of yesteryear, uh, you know, with sort of the backroom discussions and, and things of, of that nature, just because that's, that's the Columbus they're familiar with. But that's a Columbus that couldn't, um, th that couldn't fly today because we're so much broader than we used to be. You just can't call seven people and get them in the room and change the course of the city or make a, a, a larger decision. You might be able to have some sort of executive committee brainstorming session, but if you're going to talk about something that's very controversial for the city or a, a, a seismic change in the way the city's moving, you're going to have to do the hard work of tilling the field 
out in the community because there's just too many people sitting at the table today. There's just too many um, civic leaders in all sorts of non-traditional um, roles. You work long hours. I've been a recipient of some 4 a.m. emails from you mm -hmm. um, and text. Uh, where does the work ethic come from? My mom. My mom didn't graduate from high school. Um, she uh, worked blue collar jobs her entire life, meat department at um, A&P and then Kroger. And um, she's just an extra extraordinary woman. And yet if you meet her, she's just one of eminent grace and, and um, intelligence. And, um, but she believed, as, as does my dad too, obviously, but uh, that you can do anything through hard work. And I, I genuinely believe that. Also, I've been underestimated my entire life. Um, as, a, as a young person, I was always told I wasn't smart enough for some reason. They weren't going to put me in the accelerated classes and all of that. And so I just felt like I had to make it up through the raw tenacity of an incredible work ethic. And, and so um, that's just, just my way, I guess, just my way. What's your greatest strength? Um, communication and steadfastness. What's your greatest weakness? Um, my greatest weakness is that I, um, I am very vulnerable in how much I care about certain things. So I do tend to fight people's battles for them. Uh, I did that uh, as a young person, uh, much to my detriment. I did it as a lawyer, uh, much to my detriment, and I do it in political office, much to my detriment. And the Liberty District's a perfect example of that. It wasn't my project. Uh, I didn't start that idea. Uh, it wasn't even my idea to have the housing authority thing. But I knew it was a good one. I knew it was one that um, the community needed. I knew it was one that other people were very invested in. And, um, and it was my role to articulate that, even though uh, it brought about the wrath that it did. So uh, again, that's a lifelong thing. Where does that come from? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I'll tell you, I, I've, I've told this before as an aside, as a, just a random story. But the earliest that I can remember, my family can remember, is um, I was a very, very shy kid and walking home from school um, in the second grade and there was a little girl named Dawn who was born premature and back in that day if you're born premature you always remain very, very small. They didn't have the technology they do today and, and so uh, the school bully came by on his bike and pushed her down and I took my, uh, this preceded Kermit the Frog but it was a, a frog book bag and I beat the stew out of Bobby. And, uh, and then walked home calmly. And of course, Bobby's mom called to tell my mom. My mom was so shocked because I didn't even speak. I didn't even talk out loud, hardly. Um, and so I got in trouble, of course, for fighting Dawn's battles. Um, but that's, like I said, that's just a lifelong thing. When you look at people who are trained as trial lawyers, mm -hmm. they are fighters. Yes. They are, I mean, that's that's core DNA of everyone you'll ever meet. Yeah. I mean, Advocates, yeah. Fighters. Well, I mean, in a, in a positive sense of the word, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think so. You, you take, you go up against sometimes unimaginable odds, and I have plenty of stories of that. Unimaginable odds. You don't sue the fourth largest bank in the world for nine hundred ninety million dollars, and not be able to uh, stand up in a courtroom and and fight, if you will, and advocate for justice. How'd that case turn out? Uh, really good. It was settled confidentially. Uh, and um, we were happy with the result. It did, of what? course, uh, AB and AMRO Bank. It's a Dutch bank. Uh, they did business in the United States under several names, Standard Federal. Was this a Minneapolis case? This was the precursor to the fall of mortgage, the mortgage-backed securities fraud, basically. Uh, we had to settle it because um, even though we had won in the court system, um, the executive branch of the federal government issued a um, questionable but uh, administrative uh, ruling that attempted to gut the case. So, um, in, in any event, it was settled. It was settled so they didn't have to litigate the questionable administrative ruling and settled because we were not sure we wanted to go 10 more years. Um, but when the September 2008 market crashed, frankly because of that, that mortgage-backed security fraud, um, I think we were very largely vindicated in the minds of every federal judge that had looked at that case. And you, don't do you, wanna, you don't want to leave anything on the bench. I mean, let me just say that too. You know, when I speak to young uh, leader groups and that, I always say, 
look, you are rich in value because you are inexperienced and uninformed. You don't know how things have always been done, and that is your tremendous value. That was my tremendous value when I walked into some of those courtrooms completely inexperienced, um, without a full team, for, for good reason, um, to go back to that discussion, but, but I, I had to work with my ingenuity and my work ethic, and so I always tell young people, anytime they're going to do something difficult, be able to say this to yourself. I am a reasonable person. I have worked as hard as anybody could possibly work to understand this issue. I have been respectful of all people and tried to educate myself as to what is going on here, and I have no ill motive. And if you can say that to yourself, whatever happens next is going to be okay. And, uh, and, and so that's, I think that's where I get a confidence from to go into really controversial, even sometimes screaming crowds, and, and talk is because um, I have that, that base. Um, th that I, I genuinely believe. I'm a reasonable person. I worked as hard as anybody to be there and understand it. I've respected all sides and I have no ill motive. And if you can say those things, you can, you can stand up and, and do anything. How have you used social media? To communicate, uh, most absolutely. I mean, it's a lot of times people, and also let's talk with the mayor, but, but Facebook, people will message me or post something on my Facebook wall about they're angry and they're frustrated and by the way a lot of police officers and police officers wives or law enforcement officers and their wives during this campaign process and inevitably do you respond to all of them? Absolutely and inevitably um, they have and maybe not all of them I mean certainly a few have brought something to my attention I didn't know about but but the vast majority are very very angry about a seed of misinformation they have and, um, and so I'm so happy that they took the opportunity to share that frustration and anger with me so that I can explain that that's not really what happened or that's not the fact of the matter and then give them the information they need. If they need a third party objective information giver, I put them in touch with that so they can hear it direct from the source and I cannot tell you the um, positive response. I have no present intention of running for any political office after this. I really I do not. I want to be the best mayor that Columbus, Georgia can possibly have at this time. I want to set a high mark um, so that the mayor that follows me is what I hope everybody thinks is an extraordinary mayor because I think Columbus is a remarkable city. I got into this because I think Columbus is a remarkable city that I wanted to see optimized and maximized our, you know, our full potential. I, I didn't get in it to start a career in politics. And I think whatever the next door is going to be for me is going to open up on down the road. Uh, I may become an investigative reporter for the Ledger Inquirer. You can have my job. That's right. I, I'm certainly writing a book. I've already started notes and, and I started that back in um, my legal career. You touched on it a bit, but, but really, you know, I was, you know, I was involved in some of the most intriguing cases of that day and uh, some of the things that happened behind the scenes with the value jet crash, uh, the Richard Scrooge Health South debacle, the fall of Arthur Anderson and then you know, the mortgage backed securities, those were some pretty fascinating stories and pretty fascinating players. Um, and there's great life lessons in a lot of those um, stories and in a lot of these adventures that I've had uh, and I almost felt like um, you know Forrest Gump sometimes um, you know, just in this room where these incredible things would happen, and and I was just there, sitting there in the room, and um, and sometimes when I share stories, periodically we'll be somewhere, and somebody will bring up something and jog a memory, and I'll tell them, and people are just flabbergasted that I was there or that happened, and uh, and I forget sometimes that you know, largely in Columbus, people don't don't know that background about me, and I think if they did. Chuck, it would explain a lot of um, what they see me doing now, you know, why I am so com uh, comfortable addressing controversial issues, because the truth is, this is nothing compared to what I've seen before. It's just, just nothing. I mean, you know, sure, this is, you know, it's tough, and it's emotional, and it's controversial, and I don't like people not liking me. You know, I would love to have had all ten counselors just applauding and waving the whole time, but that's not life, and, and the truth is, uh, I've been in worse trenches, 
uh, I've been in scarier trenches for sure. Uh, and I think if people appreciated that, they would uh, recognize my motives are much pur purer than, than some of them think. What do you do to relax? What, what do you do? I mean, you're wound pretty tight. Yeah, yeah. What do you do to, to unwind? I'll, I'll tell you this. I do nothing better than anybody you have ever seen. Um, I know that amazes you. But when I am off, I am so off, you, it would floor you. And, uh, and I love to swim. Um, I do yoga almost every night. I walk with my husband almost every night, uh, which is great therapy for me. I'm not so sure how much of the therapy it is for him. So you've been uh, to zero. Yeah, I've been to zero. I mean, oh my gosh, he's my therapist, uh, to say the least. He has saved me. I don't even know how much in, in, in therapist fees through the years. But um, we, has he ever has he ever said whoa you don't want to go there Do you listen to him if he if he raises a flag you're talk, thinking about doing something Yeah and he says whoa Teresa I'm not sure you want to do that yes. Does he ever say that Do Yes you Yeah he's actually um, he's actually very adept Let me just say um, Usually he doesn't say quite that because if I'm uh, very passionate about that particular course saying no you don't want to go there uh, is is probably not the way to get me to hear it. So he usually angles up um, from sort of a devil's advocate point of view and, and throws a few scenarios out there and lets me deduct how that might play out a little bit. Um, it's been a really good run and what we have in store for this community is absolutely amazing. Everything from redoing our bus service so that you choose to leave your uh, BMW in the garage because our our transit system is just that good a transit system that's hooked up with zip rental cars and uh, rental bikes and uh, one that has dedicated trolleys down Macon Road and uh, 2nd Avenue so that you know that every half hour every 45 minutes every hour that bus is going to stop there um, that's the type of bus service that we deserve redoing the 2nd Avenue corridor in the city village um, ending homelessness as we know it. Um, you know, we have redevelopment districts that are going to be on the ballot in November. Uh, we got a whole lot of things to do, and so I concentrate more on um, uh, what the next opportunities are and how we're going to accomplish them than, you know, looking over my shoulder at what has been really.